Good morning, Gordon. This is going to work. <laughs> okay, a couple of things that I did want to share uh, about me. Um, uh, we heard a little bit, I've been a part of a church community in Cambridge for uh, about 18 years now. And uh, I am from Southern California. I think of that as my home, but it's not the beautiful beach part. It's the desert part near Arizona. Uh, but my family's there, so that's home. And these days I spend most of my time uh, just over the border of Massachusetts and Rhode Island uh, in some cities called Central Falls in Rhode Island uh, and Pawtucket in Rhode Island. Oh, we got a fan. <laughs> Another little factoid about me. Got it. Uh, is that I turned 40 a couple years ago. And uh, when I was 39, I said, before I turn 40, I'm going to learn how to solve the Rubik's Cube. So this should tell you a little bit about me. Uh, I had two goals. I don't even remember what the other one was. I didn't do it. But I did learn how to solve the Rubik's Cube. Uh, and it was really interesting. It wasn't quite what I thought. I went to the University of YouTube and uh, found out that really you just sort of pick a block and you, like, from there, do these patterns so that everything that's supposed to be near that block becomes near that block. It, yeah, it was really different than what I thought, but it did remind me a lot about how I understand the church and the work of the church to be, right? There is this cornerstone, and then we just bring these pieces together into their right space, uh, depending on gifts, and see how it builds uh, this amazing thing. And so I've been a part of community building, uh, church building, I like to think, for the last 10 to 12 years. And I have found that it is a lot harder than solving the Rubik's Cube. Uh, there's this really interesting thing that each of the blocks of uh, the church, of the community, has its own legs and arms and mouth and can decide to run, skip, jump, fly, whatever, to wherever it wants to be, away from the body. Um, it has its own will. It is, like, impossible. <laughs> um, and yet, we are called to that work. Um, and that has been a part of the work that I've been uh, enjoying, and uh, I could think of a few other words to describe uh, what's been happening with that over the last couple of years. Uh, but I thought I would share with you a little bit of that journey into that. I didn't you know, 15 years ago, say this is what I was going to do. Really, it happened by accident. I worked for this nonprofit in Dorchester, uh, and I was there for a while, and I was getting increasingly frustrated by a civic association that was using the space there. They would make all these decisions for the neighborhood, and I thought they were terrible. It really impacted the youth that I worked with. It was just awful. So I said, I, I want to be a part of that. I want to change that. And apparently, the way that you do it is you own property, which I did not own. Uh, and there was like this special place in this neighborhood, Savin Hill, like it was called Over the Bridge. And those people seemed to make most of the decisions uh, for the neighborhood. And so I went over the bridge. I found this property. I did not buy that property. <laughs> Down the driveway from that property, in the back, was this little carriage house. It's sort of like a barn. That's what I bought. But it made me a property owner in Central Falls over the bridge. Uh, and so I was all excited. I was going to impact. I was going to have a big voice. I was going to make some change. But I had these two weird apartments back here in the barn. And so I invited some of the young adults that I lived with to come stay with me while I was fighting the power. Um, so that's what we did. We all lived together. After a year, I did nothing to impact that civic association. They probably didn't even know my name by the end of the year. But what did happen was that the three young adults who lived with me, they had all like dropped out of school. That was partly why I invited them. They just were having a hard time. One went back into a GED program and has since gotten her GED and went to college. And the other two went to alternative schools like nighttime, twilight things, graduated high school, and then went off to college. This is like unheard of. I worked for an organization that did that kind of work, and we never saw results like that. And so that was really impactful to me. It meant there is something about home. There's something about community. There's something about challenge and encouragement, because I was pretty busy that year doing projects on the house. But what would happen was we would sit together at the end of the night, and I'd say, 
hey, what are you doing tomorrow? I'm going to work all day. What are you, what are you going to do? You're so smart. How come you're not doing X, Y, and Z? And we would do that day after day, and things changed. Things happened. And so that uh, is what grew into what we know now as this traction model. Um, those of you in psychology and a lot of other things have probably heard a lot about Maslow and how he studied people who like have impacted uh, the world tremendously, people who like operated on all four cylinders, the Einsteins, the da Vinci's of the world, who just offered something uh, great through their giftings. And what he found over and over again when he looked at those folks was that when they had these lower order things taken care of, all the way up to the top, uh, they were self-actualized. They were contributing in amazing ways. And so I mean, we know that, we hear that all the time, uh, but it became real when I lived with these young adults for that year. And so what we uh, decided to do was more of that. Why don't we focus on just create, we don't even have to like, you know, build anything big. Let's just create spaces where needs are taken care of, people feel safe, and they are part of a community that loves them and wants good things. Uh, and so that is what we did. Uh, it was a crazy time in the housing market, and so I refinanced my barn. Thank goodness it was in a nice neighborhood. <laughs> So it was sort of worth something, and I was able to buy a three-family house in Dorchester, and we started supporting young men there and young women there. And then one of the folks who lived there with us, who was pretty clear she was never going to be a staff, she just lived here, she bought a house around the corner and started supporting people in the same way, uh, young moms who needed a place uh, to be. And so this little network grew of folks who were using their spaces in that way. Uh, after doing that for a few years, uh, what we saw was like, wow, Boston is really hard to take a next step. It's really unaffordable, and if you're close to the things that were bad for you, uh, you just keep going back there. And so we looked around for more affordable property, and just over the border in Rhode Island, the Central Falls, Pawtucket area, we found some. So again, we refinanced and we bought some apartments uh, that folks could move into affordably when they had gotten some things together uh, for themselves and their lives. We even found uh, some other cool property, like uh, this former rectory um, has like 18 bedrooms in it, uh, and we were able to get it affordably. And so that became a place when people were not quite ready to move into their own apartment in a random city, where they could come and stay for a while while they sort of got their bearings and then moved into their own affordable apartment. It's also sort of our HQ. Every party, we celebrate everything. And that's where we celebrate it. Uh, we call it the guest house. So we, together, we call it Traction, the Traction family. And what we do together, we call it the Traction life. Uh, these are some family photos from Traction, just different points where we've gotten together and taken pictures. Uh, but these are different folks who've lived together uh, in the houses that we've had. Uh, you can tell it's a really interesting um, groups of, <laughs> of folks, all of us. Um, but it's special because it's family. Uh, we talk about traction as something that doesn't end. You don't live at home forever, uh, but that is still family. I have all sorts of godchildren um, now, and I have some sisters and brothers who uh, we did not grow up together, uh, but we look after each other in some really special ways. Now, what we did find um, was that when people did move into these affordable apartments, they took these next steps, they got jobs, they were going to college, a lot of them were still not living out their gifts if that makes sense. If you have a lot of education gaps because of trauma and, and some histories, if you have uh, had little experience in, in different things, the kinds of uh, opportunities uh, that you have can feel kind of limited, uh, right? And so we saw that with folks, the kinds of jobs that they were getting, the spaces that they were in, you know, people did not care. <laughs> uh, they didn't care what their gifts were. They were saying, hey, this is, this is your space. Uh, so we were seeing that happening with Traction, and then, uh, I don't, sort of a weird way that they heard about us, but the guys who are part of Black Lives Matter in Rhode Island approached us and said, we hear about the work that you're doing, we talked, they said, we hear your concern for the families that you're supporting, but you know what, in the black community we see the same thing. 
because expectations can be so low, there is a way that people don't live out their giftings. In fact, their giftings aren't even seen as gifting sometimes. They're seen as a problem. So what will we do about that together is what they asked us. Uh, I was like, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but it did mean we had to look back again, um, look back again at these order of needs and where, what was missing with that, right? And so what we decided was, man, what would it look like the same way that we said, we're going to make sure that all these basic needs are taken care of. What would it look like to create spaces where uh, we were making sure that people were in communities that were really focused on what their gifts were? Uh, really focused on, man, how did God make you? And how can you contribute in a way that nobody else can? Uh, and then call that out and say, how can we support you to live that out? And a lot of ways that meant it had to be entrepreneurially, right? Nobody else is going to pay you to do it. So how do we make it to where you can monetize these gifts, that you can do that every day? Or it could just be a side hustle that means that you are in some way living out uh, your purpose here. So what we did, again, pulled out some equity in the property that we had. And I'll tell you, with the grace and gifts of God, it doesn't make sense when you look at my bank account. But I was able to buy some more property. Um, one of them is a small mall, indoor mall. This building here has uh, 20 retail spaces inside of it. I just, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, but it happened. Uh, so here we are fixing that up. Um, we got another building, a five-story commercial building downtown uh, Pawtucket, and we're fixing that up. So tw again, 25 business spaces in this building. It, it just it doesn't even make sense, but we have it. And so what we're doing in there, I started a company. It's called Cor Core Collaboratives. And what Core Collaboratives does is takes these concepts that are out there now, shared offices, shared kitchens, and we're like, like going to town with it shared handyman spaces where you, you share tools, uh, shared bakeries where everyone gets a rack in the bakery. And so you said you could cook. You said everybody loves your cooking. Let's see. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Now, what we know about entrepreneurship is that so much of the learning is through failure. So much of the learning is through trying something and finding out, no, nobody likes those cookies. I better make something else. Um, now, the challenge with that is that it costs. In entrepreneurship, it costs. You get a building, you set up everything, and you find out it doesn't work. That doesn't work for everyone. That doesn't work for everyone. And so what Core Collaboratives does is says, okay, we will assume that cost so that there is no excuse for you not to live out that gift. Let's try it, and let's fail, and let's try it again. So... Uh, what is so cool and special is that uh, folks have been like trying all sorts of things. It's bringing the community uh, around there together in different ways. Um, this is a picture of one of the young ladies who's um, using a shared lounge, and she's doing these open mic nights and bringing young, young artists together. And she makes money from it, and people love it, and people love it. So what I would love to leave you with is... Uh, just a picture of how we have rocked this challenge, this puzzle, bringing bricks together, uh, making this huge, this awesome body of Christ that like works in amazing ways, um, and we're doing that. But that is not true. What is really true is that every day feels crazy. Every day feels crazy. Feel, there's so much brokenness. Um, people are all over the place. Um, we're asking what the heck is going on constantly. Uh, I've got a crew of people who do the work and most of them have connected uh, with me because of other people that we know who are in special situations. And so they have really interesting ways of going about the property work that needs to get done. <laughs> Some of it doesn't go so well and we have to redo it. <laughs> uh, we also find that some of the folks uh, that we support and give affordable places to live they do not pay their rent sometimes. And so then I find myself sitting in what I think is one of the most annoying places ever, and that is housing court. And we are talking about 
reasons why people didn't pay, and they'll point to our crazy facilities team and something that they did, and oh my gosh, that kind of stuff drives me crazy, but that is like a part of my day. The other thing that's a part of my day these days is cleaning up mess. People sometimes like get a new arrangement, right? They lived with us for a while, they figured something else out. I don't know what it is, uh, but when folks don't have a place and they get a place, they just find stuff. All kinds of stuff. And for whatever reason, when it's time to leave, they don't take a lot of it with them. And so I am known at U-Haul because I have to get trucks to take the stuff away. And I am known at the dump because I have to take stuff constantly, just junk, uh, over to the dump. And that is part of my days. That is absolutely a part of my days. Uh, the other thing that we found happening is that, you know, we were making these affordable uh, offices for folks. We're finding that some people were starting to stay in their offices. There are no showers there. <laughs> uh, the fire department does not like that. That is not safe. But that is starting to happen. Uh, the other thing uh, that happened in our space is that we had a shootout. These were two tenants, both of which I brought in, um, shot each other, and somehow someone else was involved uh, in this. It was on the news. This is an actual picture from a newspaper. Um, those are in the background or our apartments. It was all out there. Uh, and so I just, when I think about this stuff and I go through the day and I talk to people, you know what they say to me? You are working with the wrong people. These are the wrong people. I hired a property management group, and you know what they said? Oh, you have the wrong tenants. You have the wrong tenants. If you just did a quarry check, if you did a background check, if you did a story check, you would find out those are not the kind of people who you should have in your space. The police, of course, say these are, the, these are bad people. These are the wrong people. You should not have these folks around. They're a problem. And even my mother, right, these are not just naysayers, this is my mother from afar in California, she says, my daughter does wonderful work. She's such a good person. And when she comes to visit and she stays in the guest house with us, she says, these are the wrong people. <laughs> she says, where do you find these folks? They don't work like you work. They don't care like you care. What's wrong here? These, I, I think these might be the wrong people. And so when I hear from policemen, when I hear from my mom, I mean, she's got a strong voice, um, maybe these are the wrong people. These are, maybe these are the wrong bricks. I have to stop and I have to think about it. I have to reflect. Now, I am not the kind of person that hears from God in that way where he like speaks and I know is his voice and I, you know, it just doesn't work like that for me. And so I tend to be somebody who's like, okay, what are the facts? What are the facts? This reminds me, I'm like learning from urban culture. Usually when you're having like a discussion, when somebody wants to like, you know, make their point, they're like, facts. And they like rattle off all this stuff, right? Facts. So I'm learning facts. <laughs> um, so when I look at the facts, uh, so I can figure out, man, am I just picking the wrong people? Are these just the wrong people? What I look at are some realities. What we know is that a powerful community for people in recovery is one that provides autonomy, belonging, community participation, empowerment, personhood, and social inclusion. I think most of the people on our facilities team is in recovery. And man, when I give them a key to anything, they don't just put it in their pocket, they put it on a lanyard, all of them. It's like a, a medallion. Right? I, I have belonging here. I am a part, and I'm an important part. I said, okay. Some other facts that I look at is that we know that somebody making minimum wage right now in Massachusetts, they make $22,880 a year if they work full time. And that's not even with taxes taken out. And what we know right now is that 67% of one-bedroom apartments in Massachusetts rent for over $2,000. That would be $24,000 a year for a one-bedroom apartment, not even a family situation. 
So I think about it. Uh, if I were looking for people who never had a problem affording housing, I would be cutting out a, a significant population. The other thing that I consider, especially having had these conversations with the guys in Black Lives Matter, is that the lifetime likelihood of a black male to be uh, incarcerated is one in three. And so if my hope is to support black men, I mean, this speaks deeply to me, I'm African American, and I have lived uh, this experience with incarceration um, with black men and in other places too. And so if my hope is to support uh, black men, I don't know that a quarry to find out if someone has been in trouble uh, is what I should do to figure out if they should work with us or if they should live with us or if they should be able to start a business with us. Uh, it means there's a lot of folks who would not make it in, right? We also know that the medium wealth in black and Latino communities has been between $5,000 and $11,000. It's pretty different than, what is it, like 200 and something thousand dollars in Caucasian communities. I work and live in a black and Latino community, and so if people have five and $11,000 on average, that means that there are a lot of people who have zero wealth or negative wealth. And so the idea that you are one paycheck away from homelessness is real for a lot of people, and I guess I shouldn't be that surprised if that's the community I'm in and I offer someone an affordable office space for $350 a month, and they think, why not just stay there? <laughs> why not just stay there? I mean, that makes sense. I wanted to share one more fact, and this is really powerful to me because I lived it. That shooting, I mean, that's one of those situations you're like, no, 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 those were bad people. <laughs> that was bad, that was really bad. They shot in the housing complex, at each other, they both got you, that was bad. But when I think about the facts in that situation, I gave both of the young men who were tenants, uh, they were both tenants, I'd given them a ride the morning of that shooting. I drove into Boston with them from Rhode Island. I'm sort of like an Uber these days from Rhode Island to Boston. Um, but I gave them a ride, and the one guy who's in that picture, uh, he was ranting that morning. And it wasn't about anything anything so crazy, what he was saying was, Leslie, how can we make you mayor? I will raise money so you could be mayor. And I was like, what is going on with you? What are you talking about? He says, you know, there's just so many things that shouldn't happen, and I wish different things happened. I was like, what are you, ta what are you talking about? He's like going on and on. He's a little manic. Um, and he started talking about an incident that had happened just a little before that. And he had brought me into the incident. He said, will you go to the police department for me? There's something that happened. And I was like, oh, no, and I'm going with you. What happened? And it turned out that what happened, and exactly how he said it, the lieutenant at the police department, when we got there, agreed. He was on his bicycle riding around town. He got pulled over. Uh, the police officer pulled him over, said, where are you from? Where are you from? Kind of like how gangs do, where are you from? Where are you from? He's like, I'm from here. I live here. They pushed him up against the car. They like forced his mouth open, um, see if something was in there. He says, well, why are you doing this to me? Do I fit a description or something? He says, yeah, something like that, something like that. He says, but where are you from? What are you doing here? He says, I'm getting married today. And he was. He was getting married today. You would think that would have been the end of it. I'm so excited for you meant nothing. It kept going. The lieutenant came. And what they did was took out a camera and took a picture of him and then let him go. And so when we were at the police department and I heard the lieutenant shake his head when he like recounted what happened, and he says, well, why did that happen? And, and what was that picture for? And the lieutenant said, oh, that's, that's standard procedure, you're new here. That's, that's standard procedure. And we were both so like, that's, you know, he's the lieutenant, he's sort of responsible, that's standard. So he like, and he did answer all our questions. He wasn't like mean to us, but we walked out of there and we were just looking at each other and we're like, oh my gosh, that is not, or that is standard procedure. It wasn't my, I didn't have that experience. But for young men like him, that was standard. You are guilty upon arrival and we just need to line up things so that when the time comes, 
we're ready for you. And that was, that's facts. I was there. So anyway, the morning of this incident, that's what he was thinking about. That's what he was talking about. And so this whole dispute that happened at the end of the day, one of the guys was selling the other guy furniture, and they somehow got into a disagreement about how much or when the payment should be made, and so it escalated. Now, of course, I am like, why didn't you just call the police? That would have been it. Everybody would have been fine. I wouldn't have tenants calling me, asking me, did you screen these people, right? This would have been so much better. But when I look at the facts, it's not that surprising that he didn't think to call the police to protect him, to take his side that he might be right about something. There are some reasons why he does what he does, and we know that. People do what makes sense to them, uh, but living with this Traction family has uh, shown me some different facts, some facts I just wouldn't even know unless I was living like family, uh, you know, with some different people. And so anyway, when I look at these facts, I say, I, I just can't look at the world, right? I have to go back to the Word. Um, and so... It is facts. We find it in three books, Matthew, Mark, Luke. It's not just some random, obscure passage. Uh, but what we do find in Mark is this whole passage. I'm going to read from the message version because it's always kind of fun. It says, Jesus and his disciples were at home having supper with a collection of disreputable guests. Unlikely as it seems, more than a few of them had become followers. The religion, scholars, and Pharisees saw him keeping this kind of company and lit into the disciples. What kind of example is this? Acting cozy with the riffraff. Not the former riffraff, not the reformed riffraff, not who people think are riffraff, the riffraff, right? Jesus overhearing shot back. Who needs a doctor? The healthy or the sick. I'm here inviting the sin sick, not the spiritually fit. So I'm going to leave you with that, the word of the Lord. These days, I'm thinking, I'm working with the right, wrong people. <laughs> uh, so it sounds like we're dismissed after this. Thank you guys for listening.